Welcome to the Love and Compassion Podcast with Giselle. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast or write a review to see more of our show. Our topic today is on psychedelics and compassion. Using psychedelics to assist in healing is such a hot topic right now that we brought someone special to talk about this important issue. Please welcome our guest, James W. Jesso, who is an author, international speaker, and podcast host of Adventures Through the Mind, where he engages in dialogue around psychedelics and their role in social development. His work is inspired by his healing path through depression, substance abuse, trauma, and focuses on translating the profound insights of the psychedelic experience into a higher quality of life for both the individual and society. Please join me in welcoming James. Hi, James. Hi, Giselle. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Can you begin by sharing a little bit about what got you into psychedelics and how that specifically helped you heal from your previous trauma? Well, my story with psychedelics goes through different phases. They were not they were not always in my life with the degree of respect and care and reverence that they are now. They entered into my world early around 14 or 15, if you don't count the day I found myself very excited and inspired by what magic mushrooms are when the police <laughs> officer came into my grade school class to teach me how to just say no to drugs. But so I my first introduction was early in my life. And at that time, they were mostly a plaything that mostly were a reasonably good time most of the time, but didn't really have much of a giant impact on my life, except for just a couple of cool experiences that were somewhat insightful. Later in my life, I got into taking psychedelics in my 20s as a part of a larger sort of relationship with drugs that was based more on escapism and being reckless and being hedonistic. At the time, I didn't think I was escaping and being reckless. Well, I knew I was being reckless. I just thought I was young and flying high and loving life and doing whatever I wanted because I could within, within a certain degree of what you know I wanted to do and what was actually mostly legally available for me to do. Obviously the drugs, none of them were legally available, but that's a whole other story. So yeah, it wasn't until in at about the age of 23, three, that I was coming through an experience where I had just found myself out of this reckless substance use time in my life, feeling really damaged and really grappling with a lot of things that were a cause of that lifestyle, but also were brought back up as a consequence of that lifestyle. Because making those decisions at the time was not a decision, were not decisions that I was making from a very clear, coherent, mature, healed, healthy, integrated place. They were decisions I was making out of out of, of a place of wounding, a place of sort of a misplaced sense of identity. And if I were to go back further, you know, you know, behaviors in my early 20s being a compensational response to unmet childhood needs and wounds <laughs> that, that have I had incurred up until that point. Um, and a lot of that stuff was sort of left up in me. And um, being up in me, I was grappling with a lot of depression and anxiety. And uh, I was also grappling with the consequences of now having at some point developed a bit of a substance use habit, but also out of the consequences of that habit, a, a lot of sort of confrontations with the type of person I was in that time, which included a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And... I ended up, you know, at this time I was also in a pretty dark place and I was, I was living in my parents' house actually in their basement, <laughs> having basically done this incredible life thing. And then just all, it all came crashing down and I'm living in my parents' basement and I'm depressed and so on and so forth. And at some point I come to the sense that perhaps, you know, perhaps although the way I was using substances was not serving me and the way I was using even psychedelics at the time wasn't really of any sort of like allowing them an opportunity to really positively impact me in substantial ways that the sort of possibility for psychedelics to positively impact my life was not was not removed it, was, it wasn't impossible mm -hmm. and so i somewhat paradoxically decided that i would utilize psilocybin to heal the sort of at the time what i understood to be the leftover fractures of my time using excessive amounts of drugs and so it's like this weird thing. It's like, I'm going to use drugs to fix my drug habit, Yeah, which, you know, 
isn't even all that you know strange if you it just it was just that i chose to continue using illegal drugs because if i went to see a doctor and said hey i'm depressed and i'm anxious because i was using substances and now i'm confused and blah 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 they would probably say oh well you know here's this drug this will help yeah. with your depression this will help with your anxiety or like oh you have some strange ideas about spirits or you know reality being more than what it seems or that there might be other dimensions of existence which were coming out of my psychedelic experiences well you should probably take this antipsychotic too so yes it's paradoxical but it's also maybe part of the course to to treat <laughs> to treat with drugs in our society anyways and it was in that journey with psilocybin over the course of 13 months where i, I went in pretty much once a month every month always under the full moon first few times i had someone sitting with me and then after that, it was mostly just me alone, walking in the woods, meditating, crying, burying my soul, asking for guidance, receiving it, talking to trees, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. that, um, that I ended up on the other side of it in an incredibly healthy and resilient place, having felt like I developed something in my relationship with psilocybin that developed something in me that enabled me a happier, like a more stable foundation. Now, this doesn't mean, and I think this is an important point to consider, it doesn't mean that I took the mushrooms for a while and now I'm like, perfect, you know, like, boom. No, I mean, it just helped me through a difficult time and gave me in that time some skills that I've continued to develop on. And I, like everyone else and anyone else who has been healed from psychedelics continues to be, you know, struck with life as life unfolds, right? But yeah. they definitely really helped me come out of that time in my life and sort of occasioned what eventually became the reason why you have me on this show, which is my mm -hmm. larger work around psychedelics. Brilliant. Thank you. I have so many questions. Okay. One of the most fascinating things that you have just mentioned explains a question I had around the addictions versus using psychedelics and other drugs for, for healing. If, if you think of the drugs as a tool, right? How you use the tool when you are younger to escape and so on, it didn't serve you the purpose, right? Like it didn't help you. It wasn't healing. It was just, it was causing down, leading you down a path of addictions and shame and guilt and so on. But then you decided to still use the drugs. It's not like you said, well, I'm going to be drug free now. I'm leaving drugs. You, you perhaps it could be that you saw it as a tool and said, okay, but now I'm going to use this for to go into the emotions, to go into, rather than escape with it with drugs, I'm going to go into the emotions and going to use it for healing and I'm going to use it for benefit and ask for guidance in the process. And therefore it was helpful. Do you think that's, that's the case? Because I think one of the things that I've experienced is I came from a family that really did frowned upon drugs, did not think anybody should be taking drugs. And it was, you know, huge supporters of people, <laughs> people being jailed for using drugs or distributing drugs. And I used to also work in the child protection system where, where children would be apprehended if their parents were drug users and were neglecting their needs or abusing them and somehow. And so for me, it's fascinating how as a society we're shifting to see, you know, psychedelics, but also, you know, how could psychedelics and drug use be used to help and heal mental health? So to me, this raises an interesting issue. And I was having this dialogue with myself in terms of, you know, how can you have drug use on the one hand that can be really helpful? And on the other hand, it could also be such a hindrance. When it, so I think you've kind of answered it, but I don't know if you wanted to expand further on what I said. I think there's a couple of lines there that I, I find interesting. I, I don't actually think psychedelics are tools, but this would be getting more into my sort of spiritual perspective on things. I believe that, you know, Psilocy psilocybin mushrooms i don't know about the chemical i'm gonna save like just the chemical synthetic whatever i'll save my opinion on that i'm not decided but the mushrooms themselves are a plant or a fungi you know mm. so they're a once living organism that we harvest or we cultivate and we then consume and experience the biological and psychological consequences of that living organism and to me, I don't see living organisms as being tools. We could think of them as tools, although it is dead, you know, it's dry. But we, we could think of them as tools. But when we think of something as a tool, and I take this specific description from someone I look up to named Stephen Jenkinson, you know, a tool is an extension of, a human, of the human hand. And in that sense, also an extension of the human will. And when we see psychedelics or say mushrooms or 
ayahuasca or something like this as tools. And it's a very popular language, tools for psychotherapy, tools for healing, tools for transformation, tools for the betterment of well people. What we're basically saying is that these things, what they are, is an extension of human will. They're an extension of the human hand, and that is all. And to me, this is very anthropocentric and very narrow-minded, and uh, the sense of superiority that comes with such a claim um, is likely behind the various levels of crisis that we face right now ecologically and even economically and a number of other things because of how human superiority and all of the world exists basically as defined by what we want from it mm -hmm. rather than what it might want or need onto itself. Not that I'm claiming I know what the mushrooms want or need, but it's just a question. You know, if I, mm -hmm. if I have an ox, right. And that ox has a plow attached to the back of it, right. That plow is a tool, but is the ox a tool? Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe the psychotherapy is a tool, but is the mushroom a tool? So that's that's one inquiry I have, not an answer, just an inquiry, mm -hmm. a line. Another line is about context of use. And it's funny how in society we have drugs, right? And I say drugs, and depending on the context of the statement, you mm -hmm. think of a number of different things. Yeah. You think of, you know, uh, doctor medication. <laughs> you know, some, anywhere between acetaminophen and haloperidol, you know, you, you think of a doctor's oxycodone. medication, mm -hmm. right? There you go. Right. And then even if you think oxycodone, you could be thinking like, wow, an incredible painkiller to help people who are struggling with a lot of pain. Or you could be thinking, you know, 15 year olds dying on the street. Yeah. Right. And so with drugs, you could also think, yeah, alcohol, good times, mm -hmm. right? Alcohol, cigarettes, Marijuana. coffee, drugs. Yeah. They're, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Nothing wrong with mm -hmm. that. Really? You know, context. Or you could think, you know, the horrid, the horrible, the junkie, you know, this, this caricature that we have in society, which I believe is as much a stereotypical mm -hmm. description, which is to say that the way society caricaturized the junkie encourages people to be junkies as much as it encourages a stereotype mm -hmm. of junkie in order to scapegoat the large, vast complexities of what drug use actually is, which is not as easy as good and mm -hmm. bad drugs, certainly. And so that's another line of wondering. So when I think about something that you asked me there about how the drugs were different based on how I was using them differently, of course, you know, I, I, Ter uh, Dennis McKenna, excuse me, I believe it's Dennis McKenna. He's a, a very well-established commenter, researcher, academic in uh, psychedelics and especially, especially ethnobotany says, you know, there are no good or bad drugs. Drugs are not good or bad. Mm -hmm. They're not moralistic. You know, there's it, what makes it good or bad is how we use it. The context in which we use it and the context in which we use it to finding it good or bad is defined by what are the morals and ethics of the social cultural context, right? So for example, you know, it's, it's, if you talk to some people, let's say it's okay to be on Percocet, benzodiazepine, drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and consume unbelievable amounts of sugar. And you can still have your kids. And as long as it's under a doctor's approval, you know, it's all good and dandy. Yeah. Right? And perhaps it is. But you have somebody who doesn't use any of those, but they eat psilocybin mushrooms once a month under the full moon to go into a healing reverie with themselves and the forest and the spirit of the mushroom and all of a sudden, this person shouldn't have their child. Right? Obviously, they're dangerous. Obviously, they're a drug user. So it's, it's this weird, complex sort of dance society has with its, I'd say, hangups, you know, hangups around drugs, just like it has had and continues to have hangups around sex, around sexual orientation, around gender identity, gender expression. You know, there are all these hangups that we have as a society that we create these moralistic divides as to what's good and what's bad. Now, insofar as actual drug use in a person's life, you know, and addiction, I lean towards Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate mm -hmm. defines addiction something like, you know, any action that provides short-term positive benefit but causes long-term positive detriment that you cannot stop repeating the action or something like this. Which is to say, you know, if you think about an addiction, the first thought most people have is why do you have this addiction? Well, if you ask somebody why they use something, say why they use 
heroin, for example, they might say, well, it, it alleviates pain. It helps me not feel depressed. It helps me feel like I'm like I can escape my suffering. It mm. helps me feel happy. It helps me feel relaxed. Well, well, what's wrong with any of those things? There's nothing really wrong with wanting those things. No. Right. So the question is not why the addiction. The question is why the pain? Now, this is Gabor Mate. Why the pain? Mm -hmm. Right. And so then an addiction is something, say, a, a way that we're addressing pain or trauma or compensating in some way or another for a disposition emotionally or otherwise that we don't want to or are not capable of handling for any number of possible reasons, likely because it really is too much for one person to grapple with. You know, mm -hmm. and we reach to things that provide us short term, immediate, and reliable relief, but cause long term damage. Mm -hmm. And then we could get into discussions about physiological dependence, which mm -hmm. comes hand in hand with some addiction, but not necessarily. So when I look back on my substance use then, I think that there could have been a lot of positive benefit. And there was a lot of positive benefit. I had a lot of fun, I made a lot of friends. I, did some cool stuff. I had great conversations. I changed as a person. And yet there was something else in the context of my use, which was that I, I wasn't able to recognize nor capable of altering my behavior in a way that stopped the other side of that short-term gain. Mm -hmm. I had the short-term gain and I got all these positive things, but all these negative things were happening and the negative just built up and built up and built up. Mm -hmm. And so I just kept taking more and more and more to try to sort of compensate for the negative and stay in the positive. And I was getting positive, but I was also getting negative and the negative was never being addressed. And then I hit a point in my life where I was like, okay, it was actually LSD that was like, you're addicted to drugs. And I had to like, oh shit, <laughs> oh no, I, I can't help but acknowledge that that's true. And you know, it, it changed the course of, of, my, of my use at the time. And then stepping into mushrooms, I didn't say I'm gonna step into, my, I'm gonna, I'm going to use this mushroom as a tool to facilitate my healing. I had no idea what I was doing. I just trusted that the mushroom possibly could show me something beautiful. And I just said, you know, where, where's the hurting and show me how to heal. And I just did that. And, and part of it was also the healing, but it was also coming to understand psychologically what type of mindset context best encouraged me to dip into the type of experiences that I could then with a similar mindset context bring into the rest of my life in a way that those positive transformational experiences actually became positive transformations, which took time to learn, mm. which is what we talk about now is integration in psychedelic culture or mm -hmm. the psychedelic field, which was not really much of a thing that was talked about 10 years ago. It's all the rage now, but that was something I was figuring out along the lines. And all of it had to do with a shift in why, in mm. the why. You know, and, and then when that why shifted, all of a sudden something else was possible. And I believe what was possible is that what, what is the mushroom's inclination for us? I don't really know, but I assume its inclination to us is to decompose the shadow when free sort of pent up emotional, psychological resources from having to constantly be holding feelings down and you know, maintaining strategies to both protect ourselves from feeling feelings while also protecting other people from inciting feelings while also constantly being hyper vigilant in a way that distorts our behavior to only create scenarios for feel those feelings even more to then feed into the process that they can break that down and liberate all of that. And from there, we can step into something more beautiful with something insightful, revealing or healing out of, out of that. And the context of saying, I'm ready, I'm here was the way in which I allowed it to open up to me. And so I, I, I said a lot there, but yes, the, the, the way in which I chose to shift my understanding of why and what it was I was interacting with changed the experience that it was offering me mm -hmm. and shifted it from something that was negatively impacting me, sort of net negative to something that was net positive. I loved what you said about your why. You started to understand why and what you were using. And again, like I agree with that, that, the premise that there is no good or bad. It's how we interpret it, how our perspective on it and how 
the perspective of these systems we've created. Is there a difference between, and I'm sorry, you have to forgive my lack of knowledge, between uh, you would say like natural drugs like ayahuasca and mushrooms versus, you know, like cocaine and these other drugs that are maybe more manufactured in terms of helping you on the healing journey? That is a highly contentious discussion oh. in, the, in, the, <laughs> in the psychedelic culture and field and people land in different sides of it. Some people say, you know, a chemical is a chemi chemical. And the question is really like, what does it do? Can we use it safely? What harms inherently does it have or not have? Both from a actual effect of the chemical and also from a, where does that chemical come from? What is the industry that brings it, you know, questioning about the harms and, and can the cost gain analysis of the, benefit optimization harm reduction process develop more benefit than harm and if so you know it's about that it's not about organic versus synthetic that that's kind of a fallacy in a way you know chemical to chemical there's no difference now in that you can maybe say you know synthetic pure psilocybin versus psilocybin that comes from a mushroom you know there are other metabolites in that mushroom that might be influencing the experience such as mushrooms contain small amounts of a, of a class of chemicals called beta carbolines. It could be changing things, different variations of psilocybin and psilocin. Those are the active alkaloids in magic mushrooms where psilocybin mm -hmm. becomes psilocin. Psilocin is what gets you high. So, oh yeah, it's different between mushrooms and synthetic because there are these other compounds. But then there's another question about that too, which is like, is a plant more than just its chemical constituents, you know, mm -hmm. is the fact that we're not able to easily empathize or recognize intelligence in a non-mammal species mean that there isn't a there there mm -hmm. that would warrant perhaps something mm -hmm. that might arise subjectively in the, con in the consumption or any sense engagement with that plant or fungi. And in that case, probably there is a difference, you know, and of course, there's, there's an obvious difference between what psilocybin does to the brain and what cocaine does to the brain, mm -hmm. you know, and then even cocaine. I mean, cocaine comes from the coca plant. It's not a, it's not chemically yeah. synthesized. It's very easy to extract. You could go to, you could go buy some coca leaf tea from somewhere in central and South America, because you can't really buy it in North America, mm -hmm. you know, and you could just mix it with a little bit of water and a little bit of baking soda and you extract the cocaine hydrochloride. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, not enough to do a fat Hollywood line or anything, but like, <laughs> <laughs> enough to sort of increase its effect on you. Mm -hmm. right. There are a lot of factors that there are a lot of factors to consider there that are contentious and complex. But I would I would say that there is something available to us as people and as people working with psychedelic substances or substances in general, if we keep in mind that these things that we're interacting with come from a natural landscape and that they are or at least once were alive and they came from a landscape that was or is you know or once was alive and that we are in communion and connection with that place that land that those plants you know there's something valuable there to say like actually i am a part of something mm -hmm. something larger than myself something like the planet and there's that, that connection piece as well but when it comes down to what does or does not sort of help a person get through difficulty get through trauma get through illness get through you know just get through the difficult times that we've all been faced with right now you know it really comes down to the individual as to mm -hmm. what what and in what ways do substances of all possible varieties, be they naturally plant derived or not, influence our ability to get through these things positively or negatively, you know, over the short term, medium term and long term? Obviously, there's no clear cut answers here because it's different for everybody. Yeah, thank you for that. I was thinking about I had recently heard of a study that trees communicate with one another. And so I believe it's, it's if an elephant comes and tries to eat the leaves, the tree will communicate with the other trees and then they will release this toxin. So the elephants will have to go further out. And so it does make you think it, it brings a greater awareness in terms of how we define 
living in how we interact with our world. So it's fascinating. Well, to add to that is that the trees don't necessarily communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. They communicate through the medium that is the mycorrhizal fungal network, oh, which okay. is, you know, mushrooms. Okay. You see a mushroom, you're like, oh, that's yeah. a mushroom. Mushrooms are part of a larger kingdom called fungi. Fungi include mm -hmm. mushrooms, yeasts, um, molds, lichen. Lichens actually being a symbiotic life form between at least an algae and a fungi and some other things too. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking of a mushroom in particular, you know, the mushroom is not the organism. The mushroom is just the fruiting body of the organism. The organism is actually this sort of web that looks like a neural network. If you've ever seen a neural network, it's mm -hmm. like that. It's a three-dimensional web of sometimes thousands, millions or more connections mm -hmm. that are the organism that exists under the soil. And the mushroom is just its fruiting body. The mushroom is sort of like what it puts up into the world so that it can spread its spores like seeds to go out into the mm -hmm. world and to get back into the soil and lay new what's called hi-fi, which then find others and then become a mycelial network. So they grow. And mm -hmm. mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that exist under the ground and are interwoven into and through the root structure of plants such as trees and extend throughout the forest floor. And it is through the tree's relationship with the mycorrhizal fungi, fungal network that allows the trees to communicate and share nutrients between the fungi and the trees so that it's symbiotically mutually beneficial. This is a very complex and beautiful arrangement that you can mm -hmm. learn more about reading Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake mm -hmm. aside. But it also <laughs> enables those trees to communicate with each other and to signal each other of disease or other stresses. And it's the fungal network in the living soil that allows the forest as a whole ecosystem to be adaptively responsive to things happening within it in order to protect its health and integrity over the long term. That's not the guarantee that's going to happen, but mm -hmm. that is one of, the, one of the ways that it does that, which is also one of the reasons why you can't cut down an old growth forest and then just plant those same trees back. You can't just cut down a forest and plant the same trees back and think that that equates to new forest. By doing that, you've disrupted what could be 10, 20, 50, hundreds, thousands of years of deeply established symbiotic relationship between mm -hmm. the plants, the fungi, of course, also the animals. Mm -hmm. So something interesting there about mm -hmm. trees communicating and how the fungi helps to connect those trees to communicate. Now mm -hmm. you can extend that metaphor to wonder about how psilocybin happens to seem to connect us with each other and create increased mm -hmm. sense of connection, both interpersonally, but also spiritually and inter-environmentally as oftentimes people on psychedelics feel as though they become one with nature, having unquestionably literal communication and conversation with the plants in their environment. So that's oh, just wow. something to hang on. Yeah. No, this is a great segment because I was going to ask you uh, to talk a little bit about psychedelics and what you've experienced about it being helpful with mental health, helping people heal their trauma, help find greater connection to themselves and others. So if you could mm -hmm. expand a little bit on that. Well, the, presently, the, the research on psilocybin helping with increasing connection and well-being through mm -hmm. that way is, is pretty established. There's there's some great work coming out of Imperial College London through researchers, including Dr. Rosalind Watts, who I actually had on my show, and her whole work on the accept, connect, embody model for using psilocybin for therapy. And connection is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. Connection to ourself, connection with others, connection with the larger web of life even. That larger web of life you can find looking into people like Sam Gandhi, who's a PhD entomologist who explores psychedelics and naturalistic settings and their relationship to increased nature relatedness and nature connectedness. But insofar as connection that can come out from working with psilocybin, mm -hmm. in my book, Decomposing the Shadow, I talk about how we can use psilocybin to what I say is at the time described as clear emotional repression that we have all these emotions that we haven't dealt with for a long time and that and that all of that being held down sort of holds us down in a way that it sort of is like undigested food in our bellies it just kind of rots there and that psilocybin can come in and it can help us decompose just like a sapotrophs 
type of mushroom that that thrive off decaying matter assist in the decomposition of say wood mm -hmm. from a dying tree in the forest to liberate its nutrients back into the soil to be absorbed by microbes as well as other trees plants etc and then of course that would link into the animal network and so on and so forth yeah. so with that I, I i've recently been thinking about a different way to look at it and it's something like when we're holding on to things like wounds or sadness or something or leftover traumas or belief structures or what have you we're, when we're wounded in a place and we have defenses around that the defensiveness we have around that is not only something that sort of keeps us out of that feeling but it keeps us disconnected from ourselves because that feeling was a response that feeling was us responding to something something that happened in our lives so we're disconnected from ourselves and not only are we disconnected from ourselves, but the same strategies that we put up to protect ourselves from that feeling are strategies that we put up to protect other people from inciting that feeling inside of us, which means that we are sort of constantly walking around with this sort of like, you know, assessment model, this measuring stick, or like, are you going to make me feel this way? Are you going to make me feel this way? And if it's even close, then you can't get in. No, I won't let you in here. Are you going to trigger this feeling? I can't let you in there. And so in a sense, not only is it disconnecting us from ourselves, but we're also disconnected from others. Because when the walls that hold all those feelings in, the sort of strategic defensive walls around our wounds, around our pain, you know, and, and, and a lot of us are conditioned to think any type of feeling that we don't want is something that should be responded to strategically with walls and defenses, be it sadness, anger, you know, aloneness, grief, that we that we that those feelings should not be felt they're bad they're wrong you know love and light that's what it is you know like we got to feel good feel positive i am worthy despite the fact that i feel otherwise and so when we put up these defensive walls protect us from ourselves not only does it keep us locked in there and keep those feelings locked in it also create it is also a wall that prevents the nourishment of connection with others. Mm -hmm. Because if I've got my walls up around being sad, I can't feel sad. I'm not connected with myself, but I can't let anybody witness me or hold me in my sadness either. Mm -hmm. And so it's this weird thing that it holds me, traps me inside and prevents me from feeling the nourishment of connection that would otherwise help that sadness resolve itself. Not that resolving sadness is the way that we should respond to it because that's just another way of trying to make it go away and defend against it. Right. And so with psilocybin, it does something to our brains and to our minds that makes it so that all those walls that we have up, they're not really there anymore. They dissolve away. And the stuff that we're holding on just comes right out. You know, we go mm -hmm. to therapy and we try to get somebody else to sort of like strategically probe and try to like, you know, get around our defenses to trigger some sort of like insight and connection with our feelings that will enable us to sort of let them go and recontextualize them or re, you know, re-meaning them in a way that allows us to be less wounded and guarded. With psilocybin, it's just coming right out of you. I mean, with a high enough dose anyways. If you go too high, then who knows what's coming out of you. you no, know, and sometimes I describe psilocybin assisted psychotherapy as as it is presented. Psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. They're they're giving people psychotherapy. And then they're giving them psilocybin with eye shades and headphones on and basically silent while this person just does the thing. And the therapist's role then is just to help them go through the process. And then on the other side of it, they give them therapy to help make sense of the experience. It's not psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. It's psychotherapy assisted psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so because of this, right, the, the, the way in which it allows us to confront those feelings, if held in the right way, can provide us a lot of resolution, a lot of resolve. And one of the sort of like key sort of things about psilocybin is also seems to give us insights and perspectives on why that came to be, how it is that we're making it worse, how it is that we might be able to do differently, you know, like 
all the ways in which we we didn't weren't able to understand how our if, how these things were impacting our lives and how it was impacting others and how people how it was impacting our perception of others and how people actually care for us how connected we actually are and then we have this experience of these feelings ones that we pushed away in this context of them you know if it's held well and in a safe place in those feelings being held in something compassionate, held in something larger than ourselves, held in something caring, loving, then all of a sudden now we can step into the rest of our lives afterwards with those walls slightly more down. And we can better cultivate responses to our feelings and our wounds in a way that allows us to let in the nourishment of connection more so over time, which is a change in behavior, a change in perspective, a change in mm-hmm. conduct, you know, a change in our sense of self, and how we navigate our emotions, not just by default of having the experience, but the experience offers us something that we can then work with afterwards. Mm -hmm. I hope that mostly answers your question. Thank you. What I did want to just clarify, one of the reasons why people sometimes don't go to therapy or don't take drugs is because they don't actually want to face all of the stuff that's in there, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. we have a lifetime's worth of trauma and pain that we don't want to face. You sort of answered this, but some of our listeners may be concerned that if they just have experiences with magic mushrooms, that all of that stuff's going to flood them and they won't be able to cope. How is it that you can or have managed safely? How have you created that safe space? So I would say that if you, the listener, are really concerned that you're going to take these things and it's going to flip your world upside down and confront you with a bunch of stuff you're not ready for, and that's going to overwhelm you and negatively impact your life, then A, you probably shouldn't do it. Or B, you should find a skilled, trained professional to make that assessment with and have support you through that experience. Not easy. It is presently still illegal unless you have a lot of money and are able to fly to like Jamaica or, you know, the Netherlands or something and pay for these rather expensive experiences or, you know, find contact through an underground provider, which is variable you know sometimes really amazing sometimes not so amazing right Mm -hmm. so tread cautiously and the other thing is that chances are addressing what it is that you don't want to address is going to benefit you more in the long run than trying to continue to hide away from it Mm -hmm. right and it's a weird way in which you know the same defensive patterns that keep us trapped in and block others out, leave us stuck in our pain as this weird way of trying to respond to not making the pain worse, become a place in which we perceive ourselves to be safe, not because it's an absence of danger, but because not feeling that pain, not having those strategies, not warping our identity about who we are around those feelings and our responses to them is scary and unknown and unfamiliar and thus feels less safe and feels like there could be more potential danger and fair enough you know but chances are it will help you more than it will hurt you to do therapy for example psilocybin psilocybin mushrooms ayahuasca psychedelics in general they ramp that process up in a very strong way and it's very easy to get yourself hurt if you're not cautious about it you know, fire can cook your food, warm your house, save you from hypothermia, you know, but can also destroy everything you've ever known and loved, right? So I don't want to put fear in people, especially low doses of psilocybin with reasonably healthy people. Chances are incredibly low that you're going to hurt yourself, you know, but do your research, prepare yourself, get a sense that, you know, things might get difficult at some points and things might just be a blissful ride through eternity for a little while while you reconnect with the deep joy that inspired you as a child until it was shut down by someone's careless words Mm -hmm. you know so so there's something to think about there and i and 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 i don't want it to sound like yeah it's fine you should just face your shadow but you know it it can it can go wrong you know and it can go very right there's a there's a documentary called Neurons to Nirvana. And in it, I th- it was, I believe it was Rick Doblin who said, he's the founder of the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, who's doing a lot of work for the uh, medicalization of MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. And he said something like, the critics always warned that you shouldn't do these things 
because they might change your life. But what the critics don't realize is that's exactly the point, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not to minimize their potential harm. And I think the more you feel like you're going in with, the more safety and support and skilled facilitation you should have. Sometimes it could be really scary, especially because the only way for it not to go wrong is to not try to resist against and control the experience, mm -hmm. not try to make it go away, not try to make it what you want it rather than what it is. And letting go of control is terrifying for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And fair enough, you know? And so be it therapy, be it psychedelics, be it anything that we do in life that pushes us outside of our comfort zone at the, at the potential cost of everything that was comfortable within it, but for the potential gain of growth, of healing, of new levels of being able to love and relish in this gift that is being alive. Courage is required. That was very powerful. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask about, um, I loved, I listened to your lecture on psychedelics and compassion and mm -hmm. I, I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. Suggest everyone check it out. You talk about how the root of compassion is obviously calm, which means together and passion refers to suffering. So talking about compassion is literally suffering together or suffering in community. And you talk about the two different types of suffering. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit with the audience about why it's important to suffer authentically or skillfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the two types of suffering that I present in that talk is authentic suffering and reactive suffering. And I also present it being like, look, <laughs> I'm not trying to say that there's only two ways you can suffer. I'm sure every one of us could think about 20 or 30 different ways to suffer that we have skilled practice in, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but the difference between them is, you know, authentic suffering is feeling the pain you're feeling right now. And reactive suffering is feeling the pain that arises as a consequence of resisting against the pain that you're feeling, right? Authentic suffering sort of eventually moves itself through and reactive suffering never really moves itself through. It continues to be forever a compensation because like legendary psycho psych, psychedelic <laughs> psychedelic researcher Stanislav Grof says, you know, the funeral pyre of an emotion is the fullest expression of that emotion. And 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 the reason why I said it's it's important to learn how to suffer skillfully is a, a way of saying like it's important for us to understand how to be with pain, emotional pain how to be with sadness, with grief, with, with inadequacy, with worthlessness, helplessness, hopelessness in a way that, in a way that doesn't create greater suffering as a consequence of trying to react away from them, that we learn ways in which we can feel our feelings as they arise. Not easy, not easy at all. And learning learning to suffer authentically, which is basically just learning how to feel pain without emotional challenge, uncomfortable emotional experiences without trying to make them go away first. The reason I say that that's important in compassion is that if we are to learn how to suffer together with someone, then we first need to be able to be moved by their pain mm -hmm. and to be moved by their pain in a way that allows us to be with them in suffering. Now, in the talk, I also outline how this is different than empathy because it's not just like us being in their suffering with them, just resonating, but the, that compassion comes from being a place and rooted in a sense of safety in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're connected with that suffering with them, but we're rooted in a sense of safety in ourselves because those feelings that are being brought on are not ones that are unsafe for us to feel as a consequence of witnessing them in another person. Mm -hmm. And people can listen to the whole talk on, on yeah. my website or on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In your, your podcast, you talk to, I'm just, sorry, I just want to make sure that I have her name right. Akua Oso of, Ofosuhene? Akua Ofosuhene, yes. Akua Ofosuhene. Mm -hmm. About how, when you look at compassion in terms of, you know, having self-compassion for our suffering, compassion for others, 
and then a more global compassion in terms of ending things such as, you know, racism and so on. She talks a little bit about how psychedelics can help on the journey towards addressing racism. Can you share a little bit about how psychedelics could have that larger global impact? Do I, as a white guy, want to talk about how to use psychedelics to make racism go away? <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely, <laughs> but I think I think Aquia's words stand for themselves if you want, if your listeners want to go check it out. But from what I understand and, and what I agree with is that is that there's a lot of pain and blame and hate and prejudice and a number of things that exist in all of us that exists for a variety of reasons usually it's from being wounded somewhere you know or you know we inherit our prejudice according to who i mentioned earlier stephen jenkinson you know so we inherit some of these things wounds pain trauma prejudice racism sexism misogyny it gets passed down through the family through the cultural lines as well and that in there is a lot of resistance to feeling that pain and maybe a lot of resistance to feeling the impact that our prejudice has on another person. You know, there might be a lot of, there are a lot of people I think who, you know, express to, they, they internalize and express prejudice that they do not recognize as being prejudice because to recognize it being prejudice means grappling with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. And presently, we aren't in a culture or a society where guilt and shame are safe things to feel. The reality is in our society, blame and shame are weaponized in order to manipulate people to behave according to what other people expect of them. And we're in a situation socially and culturally where there is no capacity for someone to play out a redemptive story. Did you make a mm-hmm. shitty tweet 10 years ago yeah. that kind of sounds racist according to what we think of now, but at the time was actually common, common speak that you didn't really think about? Well, guess what? You're a racist now and you're a racist forever. Canceled. Yeah. Right? So, so, so there is no, there is not only is there's no encouragement for people to really own where they've been wrong, unless they do so sometimes in a self-hating way, then it's okay. So there's no sort of like avenue to to really hold our blame and shame as an opportunity for this redemptive story. Meanwhile, most of us have conditioned ourselves and been conditioned to resist blame and shame as much as possible and contort ourselves in order to protect ourselves from feeling it and to protect ourselves from being sort of called to feeling it because of how it's been weaponized against us. And psychedelics can take all of that down and force us to deal with what's actually going on in there right? Mm-hmm. It could also confuse us. It could also, it could also make us worse, you know, like it's no guarantee that I take mushrooms and I become a better person. I, you know, like there are people who take lots of psychedelics and they end up still being prejudiced and angry and hateful, you know, how that applies to how there could be a dismantling of institutions of racism and sexism, et cetera. I think Aquia's, like I said, words stand for themselves. I'm trying to sort of represent what she was saying here and mm-hmm. my own perspective simultaneously, but I don't, I don't entirely know. I don't think any of us really understand how to do this yet. You know, mm-hmm. there are some people who have great ideas, like Aquia, for example, or like Chloe Valdry and her theory of enchantment, anti-racism model. You know, but we don't really know how to do this yet on large scale because we've never been sort of like confronted with the reality of how messed up all these, all these different expressions of institutional prejudice are, how embedded they are in a way that is like, whoa, we need to revamp this, you know? So I don't think we, I don't think we really know how to do it yet. I mean, some people say that they know and they could be right. So I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's an answer. That's such a big question. That's great. And yeah. I appreciate that you're, you and your podcast are looking at these topics, right? The, the fact that we are having these conversations about how can we uh, be more forgiving towards one another? Cause I often ask myself, I'm like, where did forgiveness go? It just feels like, right. Like, I mean, I, I have hurt people not intentionally, but I, I have wanted to be forgiven and I have forgiven people that have hurt me. And I think, my relationships are better because of it. So I often wonder 
like what has happened. I'm cognizant of the time. I'm wondering if there's anything you would like to share with the audience about what you're working on. Uh, now, this podcast will probably be a couple months in. So I was just wondering if there's anything you want to share with the audience. I'm writing right now. It might be a book, but I'm not sure. I don't know if anyone has ever written a book before about something that is unlike anything anyone else has said that is on the edge of your thinking and is revealing itself to you as you're attempting to conceptualize it and narrativize it in a way that is coherent to others is hard. <laughs> it's tough sometimes. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to take. Certainly a lot longer than I thought and probably longer than I think, but hopefully not as long as I am afraid of. So yeah, stay up on that. Whenever you tune in from this point on, that's a possibility. And uh, I will be continuing to produce the podcast. And that's sort of my main go as I work on the book. I also provide coaching for people who are looking to get into psychedelics or mm -hmm. looking to make sense of an experience. I don't provide psychedelics or therapy in that sense. And I'm not a doctor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or anyone with any numbers and numbers of letters at the end of my name. So I can offer some experience from that point, but that's about all. But I, I do offer integration coaching for people who are, who are looking for that kind of support. And all of that can be found at jameswgesso.com. And the best way to stay in touch with me would be to sign up for my newsletter, which you can find through there. Thank you so much. It was such a fantastic conversation. I wish we had more time. Uh, please check out James's website, www.jameswgesso.com and his podcast, Adventures Through the Mind. And join us soon for another episode of our show.